I'm using enough hemp and you know so many of the things that were here at this conference where hemp is a revolutionary material. Um, it can be of course made into clothing, it can be used to make uh, you know biofuel, uh, it actually pulls a tremendous amount of carbon out of the air. So there are certain things where you're like, oh wow, if we just realigned a lot of the materials and resources around us, you know, right. that's like, a good one. Yeah. I like that. I mean, okay, let's let's get meta because I have a feeling you, you you're an ideas person. So your average person right now is bombarded with so many things. We're looking at students being uh, bombarded with debt, for example. We're looking at the economy is in the middle of a hidden recession. In fact, it's heart heartbreaking. Uh, in New York, we now have as many homeless people as during the height of the Great Depression. And um, so that's a critical sign. I mean, something's really wrong. Mental health, economic consistency, you know, you know the living wage. So that's going to get deeper and weirder as more and more electronic media and other forms of artificial intelligence, other things kick in. People are going to be radically displaced from the economy. In fact, they already are. In New York, as you walk down any street, you're going to notice a lot of empty storefronts as well because the landlords won't adjust their rental rates uh, and they'd rather sit on an empty space and then have a chain store come in and get rid of the mom and pop businesses, the small businesses, stuff like that. So it's a, the nickname right now in New York, they're saying it's retail apocalypse. San Francisco, you're probably facing a similar crisis because of uh, the tech sector and, and the housing, you know, kind of issues. And the homeless, I just walked around this morning, the homeless thing here is pretty deep too. It is. So those are just... Retail apocalypse is also pretty real across uh, the middle of the United States. It's been right. for a while, yeah. So everyone is getting all their critical information, financial information from the internet. So the whole economy now is now, people are being conditioned to consume far more than they need. And things like that, like hyper-advertising, hyper-consumerism. Yeah. So these are things that... Versus creation. Right. And creating, it's like... is meaningful. Right. And, and gives people, like you said, the dignity of work, the dignity of a sense of engagement. No, someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we? And what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site at the beautiful New West Summit, number five, the Cannabis Tech Conference. We are now going to be talking to Paul Miller, a.k.a. DJ Spooky. What's up, Paul? Yo, what's up? How you doing? Thank you hey. so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I just got off a flight from New York, and as always, the weather here in San Francisco is gorgeous. I love uh, California. You guys don't even know, man. So It's so nice out here. We don't got the six months of freezing cold New York <laughs> temperatures. That's right. That's yep. right. Paul's background so interesting. Musician, futurist, a Google artist in residence. So teach us about what you've been up to with composing, multimedia art, writing. Um, tell us about what you are passionate about. Okay, so uh, just for those out there in the world who are you know just newcomers to my vibe. Um, so my name is Paul Miller, aka DJ Spooky. I'm a writer, artist, and musician, a composer. Basically, I live in New York, but I travel all the time. So a lot of my work it looks at the connection between technology, art, and music. S simple, three things. But uh, the, the glue that holds it together is a kind of a passion for social justice and environmental justice. Um, and many of those issues come out of, I think, you know, both my parents were professors when I was a kid. Uh, my father was dean of Howard University's law school, uh, and my mother was a historian of design. So I kind of just grew up in a household that valued and respected information a lot. Uh, but here we are in the sort of, I, I am so hesitant to say the Trump era, but the AI era yeah. could be an interesting <laughs> way to put it. Really. Yeah, and so information and technology, meanwhile, are far outstripping many of the social dynamics of our time. So if you look at what's going on with politics uh, versus the, the arts, or the arts are far more engaged with technological evolution at the moment. Um, this, this is from my own opinion. And meanwhile, a lot of the policies that are being uh, engendered, is especially with this current administration and so on, so tech is evolving, yeah. but art is not keeping up as fast as tech's moving. No, in fact, art is moving it's just as fast as in, in, in tandem with, with technology. Tech? Okay. But I feel, politically speaking, a lot of the policies that we're seeing um, just are hamstringing people and like not necessarily... Um, Enabling creative flourishing of yeah, the yeah. arts. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to put it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us about how you see tech art and music uh, collaborating for social justice and environmental justice? 
Right. I mean, half the battle right now is critical thinking, like getting people just to be aware of how many variables are in, at, you know, in play. And so for, for me at least, um, again, like we're here at a cannabis uh, conference, and I, you know, I barely even smoke, but I'm very respectful of the whole issue of the innovation. So I'll give you a, a funny example. is like the de decriminalization of all of this stuff that we're here at this conference, you know, sparked an entire new economy. And that has helped so many people, but at the same time, it could be more dynamic and more, uh, I, I'm a big fan of like, once you get like that innovation going, if you create more and more feedback loops, um, you can create a, mu a much more robust situation. So Canada, for example, took a similar approach, but then blew the door open because they were far more dynamic with their uh, policies at a governmental level. Uh, your, your average American and uh, entrepreneur uh, is burdened with a tremendous amount of, um, you know, ambiguity. I mean, Jeff Sessions, the guy who was the former attorney general, c created a nightmare uh, because he personally just, I don't know what his, his again, these people are, you, they're crazy. You just try <laughs> them crazy. Uh, so. Old ethos, old code. Yeah, evil and stupid. That's, you know, just uh, ES. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of the way that, when you say co old code versus new code, that's a, yeah. that's a much more polite way <laughs> of yeah. saying it. But, Aim to um, do my best to respect the humanity no matter what. That's a good one. I mean, I'm working on that. At the moment, man, it's just like, here we are. You wake up any, you know, any human being who can rub two brain cells together and you see climate change, uh, you know, fires, floods, crazy migrations of insects that are being, uh, going extinct like bees, uh, butterflies also at the edge of extinction, all sorts of stuff that's happening. And it's like... People just, how do you incentivize them to care, you know, so. Um, do you feel like your push into tech, music, and art co collaborating uh, can then uh, entice that and catalyze that big change that we need for social justice and environmental change? And how would you see it mm -hmm. also doing that? I mean, it's been a powerful couple of weeks. I was just in New York for Climate Week, and I had a big event with Bill McKibben, who's, um, you know, a friend and just a really, uh, for lack of a better word, a, a serious catalyst for rethinking climate change. Um, and it was amazing to see uh, Greta Thunberg, who was this younger woman who was like 16. She did a talk at uh, Battery Park where like, I don't even know, like 200,000 people. Um, people have reached a tipping point, all puns intended, you know, whether the, the awareness is there. But policy, I'm using enough hemp and, you know, so many of the things that were here at this conference where hemp is a revolutionary material. Um, it can be, of course, made into clothing. It can be used to make, uh, you know, biofuel. Uh, it actually pulls a tremendous amount of carbon out of the air. So there are certain things where you're like, oh, wow, if we just realigned a lot of the materials and resources around us, we're using stuff. And you're talking about old code. We're using stuff badly. Like our buildings are old building code. Mm -hmm. you're like I hate air conditioning, for example. In New York, the summer, um, this summer in 2019, the, the electricity went out because everyone turned on their air conditioner. So the next person turned on their air conditioner, and then everyone turned on their air conditioner, and uh, it overloaded the system. I'm just giving you one example. Whereas if everyone had turned off their air conditioners and let the breeze, we're right in the middle of a river. You could just let the, you know, there's a nice breeze coming in. Uh, but instead, everyone wants that air conditioning. I'm just giving you one example, but there's zillions of others. Um, and so half the battle is just getting people to think more critically about the world around them and the materials and um, things that we can we can do better. So tell us about your process then with tech, art, and music, and how you then uh, find specific things like cannabis. How do you embed that within your framework that you use? And then how do you distribute that content um, across platforms to catalyze the change that we want to see? Um, well, at the moment, you're catching me right when I'm finishing a whole bunch of projects. So mm. for, if you ask me the same question in 2020, I'll have a lot more concrete um, specifics. Um, so I have a new album that I'm almost done with called The Invisible Hand, mm. and that's with the guys from the band The Police, which is, a, for millennials out there, I have to say there was a band called The Police. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> not NWA, uh, F The Police, <laughs> but The Police. Um, so Stuart Copeland's the drummer. He's a legendary figure. He lives out here in California. Um, that project is looking at cryptocurrency, and we're going to turn the whole album into a kind of a cryptocurrency approach to music and like um, smart contracts, publishing. Yeah. Um, then let's see, I'm finishing a book called Digital Fictions, The Future of Storytelling, mm. where I sort of dig into how stories 
shape perception. So narrative is critical, especially in this time where we're looking at what you call computational propaganda, uh, yep. where you're looking at um, algorithmic narrative. Like, I'll give you an example, again, like collaborative filtering on stuff like Twitter, Facebook, and so on. If you click on the like or whatever, it, the, the smart, or what you call neural networks, deep learning, um, actually begins to shape and mold all the things that you see around you, so you live in a bubble. Mm -hmm. And you actually won't be able to get any information outside of what you've already clicked and liked because you keep getting these small reference points. I'm just giving you that as a civilian. There's, it gets deep, but um, so you're hitting yeah. all of these different fields. You're hitting, you know, copy, computational propaganda, algorithmic bias, uh, filter bubbles. But you're also uh, bridging into into social justice and environmental justice. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So then, how would you then see something like uh, your books? You know, your book sounds really interesting. This is digital. Fi yeah, digital fiction is the future fictions. of uh, yeah, the future of storytelling. That's the full time. The future of storytelling, yeah. so interesting. Because then, from someone that's literally focused on how the different methodologies for storytelling are going to be uh, exploding around our world, um, you see yourself both recording albums and distributing albums with partners like the police, and then you also see yourself writing books distributing other content across your platforms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're really going multi broad multimedia and oh, also multi-field, yeah. multi-disciplines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And then does it does it feel like music or does it feel like um, writing? Uh, does it feel like one of these is landing uh, in, in the hearts at a deeper level? Music has this ability to like bypass the gatekeeper. You know, right. stuff That's like, a good one. Yeah. I like that. I mean, okay, let's let's get meta because I have a feeling you, you you're an ideas person. So your average person right now is bombarded with so many things. We're looking at students being uh, bombarded with debt, for example. We're looking at the economy is in the middle of a hidden recession. In fact, it's heart heartbreaking. Uh, in New York, we now have as many homeless people as during the height of the Great Depression, and um, so that's a critical sign. I mean, something's really wrong. Mental health economic consistency, you know, you know, the living wage. So that's going to get deeper and weirder as more and more electronic media and other forms of artificial intelligence, other things kick in. Yeah. People are going to be radically displaced from the economy. The fact they already are. In New York, as you walk down any street, you're going to notice a lot of empty storefronts as well because the landlords won't adjust their rental rates uh, and they'd rather sit on an empty space and then have a chain store come in and get rid of the mom and pop businesses, the small businesses, stuff like that. So it's a, the nickname right now in New York, they're saying it's retail apocalypse. San Francisco, you're probably facing a similar crisis because of uh, the tech sector and, and the housing you know, kind of issues. And the homeless, I just walked around this morning, the homeless thing here is pretty deep too. It is. So those are retail just- Retail apocalypse is also pretty real across uh, the middle of the United States. It's been right. for a while, yeah. So everyone is getting all their critical information, financial information from the internet. So and that not, means, oh, and just quickly, mm -hmm. also this is also similar for other countries around the world where Alibaba is doing the yep. distribution to, right? So this mm -hmm. is happening all over the place. Yep. So there's people that will need to find some sort of dignity and humanity and meaning in life uh, when their work is displaced by the artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. And so that's almost almost a foretold conclusion. I mean, I think we are looking at a radical shift of the economy, and so my book, Digital Fictions. I usually publish with MIT, um, so for those out there, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, it's one of the best tech schools in the country. Um, but this one I'm doing with Duke University Press. And again, I'm not, I'm not finished with it yet because this landscape keeps changing. Every couple weeks there's new developments and evolution. Like the other day, um, I was, there's a really, I'm, I'm going to pivot back to what we were just talking about. But um, So when you look at the economics of like the last couple centuries, it's been the basic uh, production of physical goods and the idea of scarcity. But if we circle back to the 21st century, we're now moving more and more into an attention economy. And so influencers, all sorts of people are making millions of dollars off of clicks and likes. In fact, billions. I mean, you know, so yeah. the eerie thing about physical goods versus perceptual goods, I mean, literally economists call it perceptual goods, like uh, how many clicks, likes, and so on. I mean, if you look at Facebook, if you look at all the major, the, the Furious Five, as we call it, you know, in hip hop, it's a... Uh, I use the term the Furious Five because it's Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. But Fang is another one. Right. Um, yeah, so you got Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, et cetera, Google. Google yeah. so, <coughs> so all of that is not necessarily, that's a deep concentration of wealth. And so we're now, I think, just facing the notion of a critical transition. 
Part of that has to do with the creative economy, which mm -hmm. is means this yeah, narrative storytelling, uh, new methods of, you know, podcasts are huge right now, uh, yeah, everything. Yeah. So all of those are people d coming into a better sense of consciousness. That's my own take, you know, and I'm writing a book about this, I'm doing all this research. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the political system uh, that thrives on ignorance. And so because of that, like Trump is a perfect example, you know, they've, they've thrown up this huge radioactive smoke screen around Trump policies. Like hemp should have been legalized decades ago, realistically. Mm. Um, and it's a great material. Or never uh, illegal in Yeah, the never, place. right. Yeah. Yeah. Always yeah. used as a tool for spiritual ascension, yeah, across all different And even the first American flags are made from hemp. I mean, if you want to go back to deep old school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you look at any of the first, uh, you know, uh, flags of 13 colonies, they were made from him. So I chuckle about that because here we are in the 21st century, so we're facing a crisis of climate because we're going to be seeing mu much more climate refugees. If you look at the Mediterranean, if you look at what's going on in the south of America right now, all those states are going to be hammered with storms, like a lot more. And then, of course, uh, global warming with the ice sheets, Antarctica. All this has to turn to how people tell themselves the story when they wake up in the morning. Yes. Uh, so, amusingly enough, uh, people are calling this era the Anthropocene era. Yes, yes. So the human impact on our planet is unquestionably changing things. Uh, climate change is man-made. Um, By far, humans are the greatest impact factor, the greatest variable on the trajectory of the planet now. Right, yeah. so the Anthropocene era means pe it's about people. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I'm just kind of riffing on that with you for a second because I'm fascinated with, we can all change. I mean, we can wake up tomorrow, and there's a very famous phrase from Adam Smith, uh, who's generally considered to be the, the godfather of liberal economic theory, where he says all um, money is an illusion. And so um, he takes it even further, says all money is a matter of belief, like you believe in a currency or you don't. Yeah. Um, and if you know, like if you look at market forces, if you perceive something going down, amusing enough, everyone else will start selling and the, the market crashes, or if you, everyone starts start seeing something going up, everyone starts. It's amazing because you can actually quantify that. And like I'm a regular runner, for example. Oh, give me just a moment to yeah. everyone, hold on. Let me get that sensor back on. <laughs> There, uh, we, there go. we go. All I right. like the fact that you just have to do a little choreography. The little, yeah, we got to uh, do the little dance and then the <coughs> back With on. the you know, dancing about architecture, you know, yeah, kind yeah. of move in there. Um, so yeah, I mean, these are all things that can change. I firmly believe that the human psyche, the human spirit um, sways towards the good. Uh, the problem is, uh, is levels of awareness, levels of ignorance, and uh, manipulation, you know. It's like, so the whole economy now is now, people are being f conditioned to consume far more than they need. And things like that, like hyper-advertising, hyper-consumerism. Yeah. So these are things that... Versus creation. Right, and creating, it's like... is meaningful. Right, and, and gives people, like you said, the dignity of work, the dignity yeah. of a sense of engagement. Um, so as we move further into the 21st century, these are things that are, that's on my mind right now. And as we, we're at a Canvas um, convention, it's kind of cool to see a lot of people innovating and trying to come up with new approaches. So I've been walking around a little bit and just get a sense of what's happening. It sounds like the, if maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, this biggest principled takeaway is a fire <coughs> in the morning, every morning, that can bring great value to yourself, to your family, to your community, to the world. And by having that, and by uh, that sort of a meaning and drive, having that fire is, could be some of the biggest solutions to social justice, to environmental uh, issues, to the artificial intelligence future that we're moving into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and amusingly enough, man, it takes more money to put somebody in jail than to send them to Harvard. I mean, it's like, there were some really funny articles, uh, not funny, well, Funny, bad, not funny, good. And so maybe some social scientists and uh, other people um, would uh, argue that uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's we, we are all born with different cognitive capacities. And so in order to be able to, um, to help uh, get someone excited about learning and to put their trajectory towards um, finding a North Star um, rather than um, becoming incarcerated um, is the big uh, thing there to figure out. Right, I mean, so when you talk about finding your North Star, I love that phrase because uh, North for African American culture during the slave time was where you had to go for freedom. 
So people would literally follow the North Star and there was an underground railroad, all sorts of stuff that would give you a narrative of, again, a narrative where people are saying, follow the star, follow the solace. So, so it was still a yeah. story and it was still a kind of, if you look at all the earlier African American hymns, which of course then became blues or then became hip hop and so on, amusing of the DNA was always about uh, liberation and attaining freedom. The, the song after song, story after story. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. Right now, what we need is better narratives, better stories to give people a sense of being a stakeholder in change. Yes, um, yes. And I, I don't love even. That. Some people are like, "Oh, we need a revolution. We got to like, wipe out everything." I actually think the better solution is is uh, giving one or two generations of people better critical th thought tools, and you could see the whole world change. That's a big one, yeah. and also, like you said, um, inclusive stakeholding, the mm -hmm. incentive structures yeah. as well around that. Um, two quick questions that we like asking our guests on the way out. The first one is, do you think we're in a simulation? <laughs> okay, there's a gentleman named uh, Gates, G-A-T-E-S. Uh, I was blank on his first name. Is it Sylvester Gates? Let me look that up really quick. Let's look at He's an African-American quantum uh, physicist who's doing some really cool Sylvester stuff. Sylvester Gates. Um, and he has a big Yeah, afro. right here. Yeah, yeah, this is him. Right. Right. Sylvester Gates. If you Google him yeah, and yeah. look up He's, Sylvester he, Gates. He had a great uh, bit on uh, with Neil deGrasse Tyson on right. Star Talk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson and him got pretty deep into this whole uh, yes. simulation yeah. theory. Uh -huh. I, it's kind of multiple choice question slash multiple choice reality. And um, there's a lot of quantum physics that's built into human perception. Totally. So if you perceive something, you change it. And there's a lot of theories around what you call Schrodinger's paradox or the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Again, um, my museum of both parents on both sides were professors, and my grandfather taught uh, a little bit of quantum physics and uh, quantum chemistry and other stuff. So I had, we had this kind of dinner table conversation. But so I'm not a specialist, but family and other people around yeah. me, and I have a lot of friends who are are serious quantum physics people. So my take on it is that we live in a universe that is an optimization of uh, the realities that are, were possible. So if you look at Brian Greene, who wrote a great book called The Elegant Universe, he's a friend of mine. He wrote the introduction to two books of mine ago. Um, he has a theory that there's multi multiple universes, and the ones that we inhabit are infinite, uh, but the fact that we perceive them has withdrawn them out of probability into manifesting our current situation. So mm -hmm. the infinite possibility mm -hmm. at every thought, yeah. which is kind yeah. of like yeah. mind-boggling. I love that. Um, and he's written a whole series of books. He's at Columbia University. Look him up. Brian Greene, great guy. Um, but that also aligns with, amusing enough, more ancient traditions of mathematics and thinking, mainly the, um, uh, in what happened in India and the idea of infinite universes as well. Yes. Um, yes. India, uh, mathematics in India really took a different turn, and Europe didn't have the concept of zero until uh, Fibonacci. Um, so, amusingly enough, um, if all the numbers we use, like one, two, three, when you draw them, they're actually Sanskrit. Mm. Uh, they're called Arabic numerals, but actually the Arabs took them from the Hindus. So, amusingly enough, all, all of our mathematics and most of the things that we're thinking about still goes back to um, some of the very ancient thoughts about infinite universes and potential. Um, Whoa. And it's so, it, I actually am a big fan of saying that it's all about research and reading. And yeah. I just want to yeah. show you a quick, this is one of my favorite photos. This is um, Einstein with Rabindranath Tagore, who is one of India's uh, most famous poets. Um, and Einstein, uh, when he was working on the general theory of relativity, mm -hmm. it's online too. You can just Google Einstein, uh, Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore. Wow, that's so cool. I appreciate you showing me that. Yeah, yeah. and that bit <laughs> was so good. Um, the very last question as we wrap here, um, could you go intro that next panel? What is the most beautiful thing in the world? <laughs> I th I, wow, that's a deep one. Okay, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? I think the most beautiful thing in the world is your contemplating of the idea of beauty, of uh, getting people to really think about all the potentials around you. Um, so when you say thing, I'm more into the idea of the thing. So I sorry. love it. <laughs> I love it, Paul. This has been so fun. Yeah. DJ Spooky, thank you yeah, so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Check out the links in the bio below to DJ, DJ Spooky. Go and follow him and go and check out all of his incredible work. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world and continue building incredible things with organizations like the New West Summit and the other great partners in your community support them as well. Thank you very much and we'll see you guys soon. Peace.